Hey, how's it going, guys? My name is Greg Brown from The Foundry. And uh, sorry it took a little while, but we had a few technical difficulties, as usual, at trade shows. But what I'm going to be showing you today is Modo, our 3D animation package, in combination with Mari, our high-detail 3D painting package, in combination with a lot of features that you'll find in Unreal Engine 4. Given um, some of the time constraints, I'm going to show you all some of the neat features about Modo and Mari and how they can be used with Unreal Engine 4, and specifically how that now, in Mari, we actually have an Unreal shader that you'll be seeing soon added to the product. This guy's smiling. Yes, it's badass. So anyhow. Really quickly, I just lost audio. There we go. Um, this is Moto, and Moto and Mari are my two best friends. I swear they're the only people who came to my birthday over the weekend. And uh, if I come on over to my sculpting and paint layout, I'll just quickly show you all some of the niceties. This is not a standard layout in Moto. This is a layout I developed to streamline a lot of sculpting and uh, and painting workflows in combination with modeling and UVs and all sorts of other wonderful features as well. And if I come over to our model single view, this is where I can kind of show off this weapon. Now, a couple things about this gun. I built this gun to show off a lot of different modeling methods in Moto, and this is what makes Moto really truly special, is that there are so many different ways that you can leverage different modeling skills. One of those things is mesh fusion. Let's start out there, okay? This uh, shotgun or this gun handle down here was actually created with mesh fusion. Also notice that when I'm in wireframe mode, if I hover over an item, it pre-highlights as blue, I click on it, it becomes yellow, it selects it over here in my item list, making it a lot easier for me to manage. And I can expand this, and I can show you what Mesh Fusion is. Mesh Fusion is real-time, subdivision surface, Boolean modeling. Really long-winded, probably doesn't make any sense, so let's make this a little bit easier for you to grasp and understand. Basically, you take one object, another object, and you can cut and fuse the two of them together as subdivision surfaces. And you can use them to bake down to low-res geometry at the end. So take a look. I've got this basic mesh that I've used to create the shape of my handle, and I have these secondary cutters that I can use to cut in simple slats along the side. Now, this is hugely useful because that's exactly the kind of detail that if I'm going to be baking it, I don't want to model it. So I'll just select this one cutter right here, delete that, and you can see that one cutter is gone. Maybe I want to make some other absurd changes as well. Select the cutter over here. Double click to select all connected, W for the move tool, and I can move that right on over, right into the center of a sub D mesh, cutting right through it. I can even go in and select my control curves. As I click right here, I get this beautiful channel hall, and I can start modifying things like the profile and the actual width of the fall off. So it's an extremely uh, versatile modeling tool that if you're an experienced modeler, this is going to extend your capabilities. If you don't know how to model, guess what? Now you can model. All right, so beautiful, beautiful thing to be able to work in this way. Now, one of the things I noticed, because I seem to do nothing but sit in front of my computer, on Sunday, I was sitting in front of the computer putting this demo together, and it dawned on me that, you know what? I could actually probably bake. Because when we render in Moto, here's our quick preview renderer, you see I've got my shotgun shroud, I've got my handle. Even the mesh fusion items happen to actually render. You can see those nice cuts coming through right now. And I realized that, wait, I can actually bake directly from the Fusion item. So I'm going to grab my low poly handle right here. All I have to do is come over to my new UV map, grab the actual new uh, UV map that I've created. And you know what else? I actually want to be able to grab my material. So I can select by materials, grabs the correct material for me so I get the image I want to bake from. Right click on this and bake from object to texture. And it's, I also can add my cage, which is created as a morph map, very similar to a blend shape. And now I'm ba baking my normal map from a live, editable mesh fusion object down to a low res mesh. Makes my life so much easier, less configuration. So one of the other things that I started doing is I have a habit of sub modeling. I'm like one of the most uh, you know, anal like people regarding topology you can, you can meet. Now, if I turn on this mesh, all my different parts, you're going to kind of notice I kind of gave up on that over the weekend. I've got crazy triangulated surfaces all over the place. And this is because of a workflow that's been introduced by an artist named Tor Frick, where he's using standard Booleans in Moto with a feature called Rounded Edge. So if I come over to the shader tree, in the case of the, uh, let's go with the shotgun shroud down here, because I really love the shotgun shroud. 
This was made in under an hour. Doing cuts like this is extremely painful. I didn't want to have to do a high res mesh. And if I launch the, our preview render to show you what's going on here, you can actually see that as I refine this, I've got a nice soft rounded edge here. And that's being handled by the shader and by the shader only. Down here, underneath, uh, let's see, let me go ahead and click on top of that material. It selects my material for me in the render view. I have a rounded edge width of eight millimeters. Yes, this object is out of scale. If I set that down to zero, you can see I get that hard edge and also it's very recognizable as a low poly item. And if I throw that back on up to eight millimeters, now I've got this beautiful edge bevel. And one of the things that this uh, artist Tor Frick realized was like, holy crap, this is a smoothing along an edge. Isn't that a normal? And he realized he could bake it down to a normal map. So now, actually, I've been playing around quite a bit with multi-discipline baking in a way, where in some ways, I bake down directly to the rounded edge shader, and in other ways, I'll even bake from a high poly mesh. So in the case of this body, I ran into other problems, where I was like, you know what? I really want all those nice high-res surfaces, especially the flat surfaces, to be baked from a high-res object. But the seam in between, that's really important. I can do that with a rounded edge shader instead. And so uh, if I go ahead and select that item, come on down here to show off the high-res version of it, I'll toss this guy on and turn the other ones off. And you see that I have this high-res item that I'm actually baking from. Go ahead and turn that into sub-D mesh so you can actually see the smoothing. And so I bake to and from with this item, and I also use the rounded edge shader on top. So it reduces the number of items that I have to create that are high res. And the vast majority of the components that you actually see here are all low res, non-sub-D items. And I think that's a very significant concept because this means I get to decide what I want to waste building out in high res and what I want to actually go ahead and spend time just you know, figuring out how to get the right edge bevels, localized detail, because this allows me to create details that would take far too long otherwise. Now the next thing I want to show you guys is Mari. Mari, my new best friend. Since I started working at the foundry, Frankly, I was a little hesitant at first. It's a very technical painter. And after I played around with it for like half a day, I'm like, I am not going back. I go to Photoshop these days to like do text. Like that's it. That's the only thing I do. And uh, right now in Mari, I'm showing you the Unreal Engine shader that they uh, actually provided us, the shader information to add to Mari and an environment that matches their shader setup. And so in this way, I'm able to go through and start building out layered shaders based on the Unreal BRDF. So if I go ahead and I come on down to our shader uh, layers, I go ahead and pull this on up right here so you can take a look at this. Here is the standard Unreal BRDF in place. And I can switch back and forth between working in channels, working uh, in actual layers inside those channels, and also my shader layers. And this gives me a lot of versatility about how I want to build out my materials, how I want to tweak and tune the relationship between them. Because all I actually have to do as I start building this on out, say I want to add my second layer right here. Go ahead and grab that on down. My second layer is actually in place. I'll turn that one on, turn this one on, just so that we get a nice preview here. You can see that as I zoom in, I've got a little box right here on the side. What this is, is it's a mask stack masking the shader. Mask stacks inside Amari work with layers, they work with channels, and they work with shaders. And what this is, is it's non-destructive masking. Because for any single layer, I can keep on adding extra mask layers on top of each other, not destroying the mask previously. And that's one of those things in a 2D uh, image editing application you simply cannot do. And you know, non-destructive is kind of a buzzword these days, but it's a buzzword because it improves productivity. All right, and so now that I've got that one in place, I can go ahead and just kind of come over here and start painting in between, revealing any shaders beneath, whether or not that's actually you know, a metal below, a different scratch plastic, and start building out my shader layers. It's a wonderful way to work. Now you notice in Mari, as I move the object around, so does my image move over the surface. The reason for this, What's special about Mari is that it's actually like a canvas, a clear canvas that's sitting on your screen that you're drawing on. You're not drawing on the actual surface. And you can move the object around. And at first, I'll just be honest, it drove me absolutely nuts. And then once I used a lot of the other tools, I'm like, no, this is actually the way you should be painting in 3D. One reason, Mari never seems. 
forever between many, many, many different UV maps. You could have hundreds of UV tiles painting between all the different tiles, and it does not seem because of this projection technique. The other thing is all the ways you can manipulate anything you paint. So I just created a nice little uh, warp selection that I can warp that image around over the surface, increase that, maybe grab a couple of them. Isn't that beautiful? And also, on top of that, my favorite one, the pin tool. Just hold down the shift key, start slapping down points, and start pulling that area around. Exactly. And so like, I, like my main interest is character art. I'm sorry, I was lazy, I'm on the road. I didn't get to put together a great character for this demo. But like when you're like trying to like project textures onto the surface of a stylized character, matching up like a skin texture for the eye, I have wasted way too many hours of my life just painting and painting and painting, trying to get that to match up. And now I just grab the pin tool, tweak and tune these points into place, and it's right there. I bake it on down to the surface by hitting B, and now that's actually part of my layer stack, and it's part of my actual image. Absolutely beautiful way to work. Now, certainly try and please pay attention to the Foundry over the uh, coming weeks and months. You're going to see more and more videos. In fact, I'm going to be doing a Mari demo for Mari Indie. It's an indie version of Mari that's up on Steam. It's like $100. So few limitations. You can only have a 4K texture, perfect for games. Uh, but I'm going to be showing how to actually create a Dota character with this, so painterly style textures inside of Mari as well. So it's not just a high detail, photorealistic painting application. You can use it for the stylized painting you find to be very common and very popular these days. Now another thing is the interaction back and forth between Moto and Mari. So really quickly, I'm going to come back to Moto. Mari's still running in the background, so I'll just go ahead and shut it on down because I am on a MacBook. I am not on a workstation right now. We had to throw things together way too quickly. So I'm on mid-range graphics, by the way. And as I come in here and throw on our preview renderer, got this beautiful render right here. By the way, I played with lots and lots of renderers. Moto's render, it's not just that I get paid by them, my favorite. Absolutely my favorite. All right, and if I come over to the shader tree, we have what's called an occlusion shader. And so if I throw this one shader up on top of the mass stack, you notice that I'm actually occluding based on certain uh, variables. So right now, my occlusion is set to uniform. I could set that to be a downslope if I wanted to. If you're working like a bridge and there's like drippy textures underneath, you can mask out the occlusion shader with procedurals and other image textures and have like drippy moss and stuff like that coming from the bottom of the bridge. You also could set that to one of the more common ones, convexity or concavity. So I throw this up onto convexity, and all of a sudden, I've got all my convex angles masked out. I can bake those out to multiple UDIMs or one single UV, send that over to Mari, and it becomes the focus of my texture to create those nice wear and scratches, and I can keep on layering those up on top of each other. Also, I can go over here and take a look at any individual render output. Here's my standard ambient occlusion, which is incredible. What I keep on hearing from game artists who use Moto, our ambient occlusion is just the best out there. It's fast, it's versatile, it's high quality, it's clean. And another thing that's really cool about it is what if I were to like go ahead and grab an image that like was like maybe a bump map or something like that. I'll open up my preset browser, come over to, to some of my image maps, and you know what? Just to be really lazy, I'll just drag and drop this one random image map right down here switch its effect on over to bump, surface shading and bump. And now if I come on over and make a few more adjustments to my ambient occlusion, I've got to find a location where it actually shows up. Right down here, it's starting to show up, the actual texture I threw on there. But our ambient occlusion even responds to any surface attributes that you make changes to. So if you put a bump map, a displacement map, anything of that sort, your ambient occlusion will respect that. And so this is just scratching the surface of both Moto and Mari. I also wanted to show this to you guys in the engine itself. But you know, time constraints are what it is. And the most important thing to articulate is that we have the Unreal shader inside of Mari. And that's just the beginning of it all. A BRDF can be written for Mari quickly and easily. Somebody with some decent Python chops can bring in a BRDF from any game engine, write it, bring it in, on in, and use that inside of our viewport from what I hear within half a day. I'm not a coder, so I couldn't do that. But somebody with decent Python chops certainly could. So by all means, please check out our products. 
Marty India and Moto India are the ones that are really accessible on Steam, low price. We can even talk to you about upgrading to the full versions because, well, the full versions are the full versions if you're a professional. And I'd uh, love to see you play around with these tools, see how you can use them, how you can leverage them to improve your workflows. So are there any questions I can answer? We have three minutes. A what? A conference discount. Um, not that I'm aware of, but I, I, I could say that we, we should probably look into things like that. How about we'll talk about the conference discount being uh, Moto Indie for now. Please check out Steam. Really accessible price. Moto goes down from a cost of like 1500 to like around 200 And Marty goes down from like, you know, an, an, a very expensive application at $2,000 down to 100 suddenly becomes extremely accessible. You can buy them both together. You can also subscribe to them for $15 a month. You know, so it's a way to jump in, try out the tools, and you also, as an individual, can commercially use them. You can't pass your files on to anybody else, but you can work commercially within both those applications to make money. That's totally acceptable. Any other questions I can answer for anybody about either of these products? Yeah. Um, I, I don't know if Unreal is going to be uh, you know, uh, accepting UDIMs. However, I speak to a lot of game artists. That's my job. I go to studios and talk to them. And I've been hearing more and more game studios actually using multiple UDIMs. You know, there's a lot of ways to leverage that, uh, par partially for environments, blending textures together. And also, I've been hearing quite a lot more about sub-Ds inside of games. That's actually becoming surprisingly real. And so, yeah, I've been here. I, I can't tell you who. Sub-Ds are being used in games because Open Sub-D runs on the GPU. So really, these new con the content creation applications like Moto that are very Sub-D uh, centric suddenly becomes far more realistic. And sorry, guys, it's got to end right now. But thank you so much for being patient, waiting for this to start. And please give Moto and Mari a try.